Well, welcome to Utopia. Thanks very much. It's really lovely to have you here. Um, you've written this very beautiful uh, story of your mother's life. What was she like as a mother to you, in the sense of what life lessons do you think she passed on to you? How did she equip you for life? Sometimes when I'm in a difficult situation, I think, what would my mother do? And it is always something sensible always comes into my mind. It's always sensible, but it's often usually... Um, it's always sensible, but it's usually quite bold. Usually it takes the form of... She would probably go round to the person's door and knock on the door and say, blah, 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 <laughs> you know. Whatever she had to say to them, she would say to them. She was very upfront. So she was a straight talker. To a fault, yes. And that's something I have to remind myself. It's a good lesson to learn from her because I tend not to be like that. It's interesting that you say that, though, actually, because when you think about her marriage and the fact that she was unhappy in her marriage, she didn't kind of cut straight to the chase with her husband and say, what is wrong here? Why don't you communicate with me? Why are you spending all your time at party political <laughs> meetings? What's happened? So, Well, she did, actually, but she came up against that bland side of my father, which wouldn't engage, in a way, with that kind of... Um, he was a good man in many ways, mm. but emotional giving was not part of his repertoire. So she tried, I mean, I can remember the sorts of arguments that they used to have. So she did try. The other thing is that um, she, she stayed in that marriage very consciously for our sakes mm. because she, she had had a miserable upbringing with very unhappy parents and she said to me many times, I'm going to break that cycle of unhappy parents having unhappy children. And so, in a way, she didn't need to... I mean, that's another way of being very straight, to admit it to yourself mm -hmm. and then to decide, OK, I don't necessarily have to act on this knowledge. I know it, that's enough. It's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, one of the great surprises in the book to me is that, you know, you just sort of described your father there as being sort of emotionally sort of rather bland and shut down, very committed politically, obviously. Your mother, later in life, when she got a chance to sort of develop a little bit in her own independence, um, wanted to write, wanted possibly to write the memoir that you've in a way written for her. But your father also was a writer, so you've got this genetic double whammy, haven't you? Yes, that's right. I think Mum definitely was a writer, Monkey, given a different set of life opportunities. I'm sure she would have written, and she would have written very different things from my father. Dad had always wanted to be a journalist and his parents had talked him out of it and made him do law, which he ended up enjoying. But the life of... Um, he wanted to be a journalist. I think he loved that sense of finding out the underbelly of life. And, he loved and secrets, writing. He didn't loved he? secrets, <laughs> which journalists are really good at, worming out the secrets. Um, so he wrote a particular kind of thing. He was also um, very struck by what he thought of as fine style. So his style is quite flowery and looks pretty old-fashioned these days, whereas my mother's writing was very straightforward, very much the spoken voice on the page, mm. which is our, our way of doing it. How much did your mother talk to you about the past? Because it, it seems to me, you know, as children, we're often not that interested in our parents' lives before we come onto the scene. Um, and then sometimes we get interested either because we think of this as material or because we discover that our parents actually had remarkable lives and we, you know, we might want to find out about them through a school project. But sometimes you ask nothing at all. Did your mother volunteer a lot of information? She did. She told me most of the stories that are now in the, in the book many times. Um, something would happen in daily life and, and that would remind her of some little moment in her past and she would tell me that story as a little set piece. So I heard these set pieces over the years many times. Um, and eventually, um, eventually I realised that although I wasn't especially interested, I have to say with some shame that I... <laughs> I did glaze over a bit when Mum started in on these stories, some of which I had heard several times. Um, but I realised that there was something... There was something very valuable about them, and they should be kept. Mm -hmm. I must have known that I would become interested, I think. Not that I was going to write a book. That was not in my mind uh, until after she died. But that this person who was, if you like, an ordinary person from a very uh, ordinary, modest background 
had done some fairly extraordinary things, partly because of her own character, but partly because of the times she'd lived through. They'd forced her into doing remarkable things. So that fact that, um, you know, ordinary people's stories are very often not told. Mm -hmm. Here was somebody who was telling them in quite an articulate way. This was a resource that someone would use, perhaps me, perhaps somebody else, but it should be, you know, recorded. I think one of the things that really strikes me, Kate, about the book is the frugality of her life, that, mm. that pleasures were so modest. Like, you know, when she's a young woman, the most she can hope for is a game of cards with mm-hmm. friends. There's absolutely no room for any kind of material aspirations. There's no talk of shopping as a form of entertainment. Was your mother frugal for all of her life? When she had money, she believed that you should spend it, having done without she knew that you could do without if you had to. But if you had money, you, had to, you should spend it. But you should spend it in ways that you genuinely enjoyed. So, as I've said in the book, she loved to spend money on beautiful knives and forks, which I'm still now using. <laughs> really exquisite and very expensive knives and forks. You use them three or four times a day, and every time you use them, you enjoy them. And every time I use them now, I think of her and say, thank you, Mum. So in those ways, she could be quite, if you like, extravagant, but she never spent on things that were simply ephemeral or certainly not, you know, to impress other people. Mm. Um, It was about the texture of daily life, ordinary, everyday life, not the special occasion. So she was, uh, but being a child of the Depression, she was also extremely frugal. When she died, I found an entire cupboard full of, um, we all have a rag bag in the, in the house. She had an enormous rag cupboard which was just crammed with all the fabric that she hadn't been able to throw out. Yeah. It might come in handy for cleaning, she said, and it was true, but that was a lifetime's rags. Mm. And I've inherited that and I think I've even passed it on to my own children. It's not a bad quality. This business of going shopping as a way of passing the day, I can't understand that at all. There are, better ways to spend your time and your money. Absolutely. How much did you bring your novelist's techniques to the bare, raw material that you were provided with from your mother's own writing? How did you amplify and enhance what was there? It took me a long time to realise that I had to do that because I wanted to stay very faithful to what she had written. She She left me several kinds of Things. She left me written fragments of memoir, which she'd written, mainly because I nagged her to, but she also left some tape recordings, which I'd taken when she was in her, mm. I suppose, 60s and 70s. So I had a, a big mass of stuff, and I thought for a long time that it would just be a matter of collating that, that I could just use her words. Um, and it was a great grief to me, actually, when I realised that I had to get behind that, that actually what she'd given me was a fabulous sketch but it actually wasn't quite enough to carry a book uh, for people who didn't know my mother and wouldn't hear her tone of voice and wouldn't know what lay behind that sketch. For example, she describes meeting my father at a uh, political lecture, of course, and she says, um, we went to the lecture, I sat next to him, and that's how we met. And then she said, uh, I knew I liked him, and I thought he liked me, but it was in a coming and going away sort of way. The next entry is, we married in May 1940. Now, none of that is enough. No. So, you know, I've met a few young men, and and I sort of know the sequence. You have a date, and you wonder, and you you do various things to to sort of test the waters. And at some point, he may say to you, will you come home and meet the family? So that's how that scene, which is in the book, where Mum goes home to meet my father's... um, family which was at a socially much higher class, so quite scary for her. Mm. Uh, That is all out of my own life. It must have happened. At some point my father must have said that to my mother, and she must have met her future mother-in-law and father-in-law, but she never talked about it. So that's where I had to step in and extrapolate from what she'd given me. Well, let me ask you then about something even more kind of intimate and possibly something that she would not have talked to you about then, about sex, because Mm -hmm. in the book, You make it clear that when she marries your father, she's not a virgin. Mm -hmm. She's had a couple of boyfriends before. And you make it sound as if she does that relatively easily, that she's got a fairly uncomplicated attitude to her body and to pleasure, and she 
takes the opportunity when it's there and she's not completely riven with guilt. How do you know that, given that generationally a mother of your generation would not talk about that stuff? She actually only had one boyfriend before my, before my father, and it was a man that she was very in love with. He was, he'd been her boss in one of the pharmacies. They knew each other very well, and she'd been through... His wife died, so she'd sort of been mm. through that grief with him. They knew each other very well. It was certainly not a casual acquaintance. And I th think that relationship went very deep. Um, but your, your basic point is right. She didn't feel riven with guilt about it. She was worried when she married my father that she perhaps ought to tell him. Not that it was a big deal for her, but she thought perhaps it might be for him. But I think because Dad was probably a, a man it was impossible to have that kind of conversation with, she ended up not having the conversation. And she did always feel slightly bad about it. Look, she came not from the nice middle class, but from the rural working class. Her father was a shearer. Um, her, her mother and father had a failed farm, mm. and they then kept a series of country pubs. They were, they were, um, they were quite successful. They made some money, but they didn't have any of the trappings of middle-class life, including, I suspect, that whole superstructure of guilt and conscience and, and a, a sort of uneasy feeling about sex. I think they probably had a pretty straightforward attitude to it, and so Mum had that too. Mm. What about her independence? I love the fact that you make the analogy that um, in, in dancing, if you've ever led, you can't go back to being led. There's a lovely line in the book about that. She yes. had this independent streak, and no matter how many times she was thwarted, mm -hmm. she just tried again, didn't she? Have you got that? Yes. Look, I think anyone who writes 27 drafts of a book before they get it right probably has a, a streak of that in a different <laughs> way, actually. Uh, so, yes. Look, my mother was a fabulous example to me in many ways, and one of the ways she was a fabulous example was the resilience, mm -hmm. that when life knocks you down, you acknowledge that it's knocked you down, you acknowledge that you're sad or frustrated or whatever, but you then get up and either try that again or try something a bit different. But you don't give up, because... There's nobody going to give you a hand up. I mean, that was her experience of life. I, I was different because I had my mother, always, who would give me a hand up. But she had learned that if she didn't pull herself up, nobody else was going to do it. And she, it was a wonderful thing to learn from a mother. Resilience is the quality, above all, I think, that you need to learn in life. And Mum gave it to us. And she had it mentally and physically. So if it came to it, she would build a house mm -hmm. with her husband, with her bare hands. Yes. Um, she would try and open up a pharmacy, even though at the time everything was against her in terms of women in the workforce, um, childcare, everything. I mean, she yes. just she wouldn't take no for an answer, would she? <laughs> That's right. Um, it's a fabulous quality. And again, I think it's that sense of... Um, what have I got to lose, mm. you know? Her, her childhood was kind of miserable and a lot of people are crushed by that and for some reason, who knows why, she was not crushed by it. It just made her decide that whatever she felt she should do, she should give it a go. She said to me once, look, um, don't take other people's advice about life. If you're going to make a mistake, let it be your own mistake. <laughs> and it was not, it's not a bad motto for life. Absolutely. What about as a reader of your work, Kate? Was she your first reader? Was she a critical reader? Or was she your adoring, proud mother? She was not a critical reader. She was my adoring, <laughs> proud mother. Um, I, I gave her all my books when they were published. I don't usually show them to anybody before they're published. Um, and she read them... She read them many times. The copies that I still have are very well thumbed. Um, she loved Lillian's story because she recognised something of herself, I suspect, mm. in Lillian. Um, and, of course, she, she loved... Um, uh, what was the other one that she really liked? Oh, she loved Joan Makes History. Because, again, she saw Joan... Joan is a little bit like my mother. Again, she's a sort of tough every woman who travels through the history of Australia. Um, but not just tough, she's also very feeling, not frightened of exposing herself to the, to the hurt that can come from being emotionally open. Mm. And that's, that's the other remarkable thing about my mother, that her background didn't make her close down emotionally. 
She was prepared to suffer because life was suffering. But she also was prepared to have the open-mindedness, the curiosity and the empathy for others. So when she discovers mm -hmm. indigenous culture, when she goes into the outback for the first time, there's an incredible realisation about what that civilization means and what its relationship to the land that she's always thought of as her country um, is. And so I'm guessing that some of that, in a way, whether it consciously or unconsciously, informed the secret river. Oh, no question. Uh, consciously, I, probably somewhere not far below consciousness was my mother. In fact, I think it was conscious because I remember quoting at the time. As a child, I remember my mother, every time we went for a picnic to some wonderful spot, she would look around and she would say, what paradise this must have been for the Aboriginal people before we came along. Now that is a powerful thing for someone to tell you. And, you know, I looked around and I thought, oh yes, that's probably right. But, you know, it lodged in yeah. my mind, so I have her to thank for that as well. You do. You her do. trip to Uluru in 1959, which was really the, only about the second year that it was possible to get there as a tourist, um, was a life-changing experience for her. And when she came back, she did her best to transmit some of that new awareness to us. Mm -hmm. And I think it did, it did seep in at some level. Kate, when you go about your daily life, do you ever catch yourself feeling that there's a bit of your mother in a gesture or in a <laughs> facial expression? Is there a trait of hers that you can feel living on in you? <laughs> yes, I think so. There's a little thing that I do with a pen, you know, a sort of fiddling thing that I recognise from my mother. Um, her thrift also, the difficulty I have in throwing away food uh, you know, I will work very hard to eat something, <laughs> even when it's past eating. <laughs> and if it's in fact past eating, I will then give it to the worms in the compost heap. She was a great composter. So that kind of thrift, uh, it pains me to see waste. Uh, and I, uh, But I think more than that, there is a kind of um, determination that I have, that I learned from her. It's a good quality. Uh, you know, it's difficult writing books and being a writer has been a difficult life. She always supported me in every way she could when I made that choice. Um, but I think her determination and that preparedness to sort of, you know, you write a disaster of a draft and you know that it is absolutely not working and you think perhaps this is the book that I throw out, that I just abandon. But each time I have picked myself up and thought, well, I'll do one more draft. That's what Mum would do. Kate Redwell, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>